if you look at the total addressable market of privacy, it's one of the fastest growing areas right now in all of cyber. And it's one of the fastest growing areas in, in data security. And it makes sense because you have a lot of a lot of requirements now, maybe at a country level or at a national level, or could even be down at a, uh, at a city level. I'm thinking about New York City as an example. And there's a lot of requirements that businesses are going to have to figure out how they adhere to. And not all of them, especially the larger ones, know what to do. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a free weekly podcast featuring stories from the entrepreneurs and icons of commodities, capital markets, and technology, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we explore the question, is capitalism in crisis, and will building smarter markets be the antidote? Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that explores how financial and technology markets can be redesigned and improved to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Smarter Markets is brought to you by ABEX, and I'm Michelle Dennity, your co-host and guide through the intersection of privacy, security, and digital technology. Today, we welcome superstar and super fabulous fun guest, Kunal Anand, Chief Technology Officer at Imperva, to Smarter Markets for our latest series examining the evolution of digital identity and how self-sovereign identity specifically can help bring trust and privacy back into a consent-based economy. I cannot wait. Kunal joined Imperva when Previty, a company he co-founded in 2013, was acquired by Imperva in August 2018. Before joining Previty, he was the Director of Technology at BBC Worldwide. Mr. Anand has a deep history of digital innovation and information security and has held roles leading security, data, technology, and engineering teams at Gravity, MySpace, and the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Super exciting. It's practically like having an astronaut on our show. Stay tuned. The latest chapter of Identity Sequent X is coming up next. And now back to this week's episode of Smarter Markets. I am so excited to welcome our next guest, Kunal. We've heard a little bit from your formal grown-up bio, but tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your journey, particularly in this series about identity and identics. Where did you come from? What are you doing? Why are you at Imperva? What's going on? There's a lot of a lot of questions there. So I'll I'll start with uh, a little bit about me. So my name is Kunal. Uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, really thank you for having me on. I'm going to enjoy this conversation. I can already tell. My co-founder and I started a company back in 2012 called Previty. Uh, we were focused on really changing the way that organizations protected themselves with respect to application security. We saw a pretty big gap in the market where there was an opportunity to get closer to protecting applications and APIs by being directly in those things rather than around them. So we started a company. Uh, we built uh, quite a bit of notoriety. We ended up getting acquired by Imperva in 2018. In the beginning of 2019, I ended up getting appointed as CTO for the, the organization. And it's been a very, very fun journey since. So in my role as CTO, I get to focus on things like strategy, product vision. I still get to write code every once in a while, not as much as I used to, I'll admit, but it's been a lot of fun. You know, I was reflecting with a friend recently in 2019, because I was new to the company, I just got put in, into the CTO role. I really wanted to better understand how our customers were using our products and solutions so I ended up traveling all over the world. This was a record for me, 750,000 miles of air travel in 2019 alone. And we were just talking about, uh, I have two kids now under the age of three. I had a newborn at that time and being on the road that often was really challenging. The good news was uh, she was able to come with me on some of those trips, which was amazing. Nonetheless, uh, I definitely did enjoy at least one part of the pandemic was being able to be at home and to just to kind of be dad. But nonetheless, it was, it's been this amazing journey over the last three years uh, at Imperva. And we as a business were focused on AppSec and, and DataSec, uh, specifically protecting data and all the different paths to it. 
that's what we do. I love it. And, and I love, um, well, a couple things I'm going to pick out. So uh, always these interviews are tinged with my personal bias. Uh, I make no apologies. I come out of the world of privacy and integrity and intellectual property. So I love that you're saying protect the app and the data. And we've heard protect the network, protect the app, protect the hardware, protect the perimeter. Rarely do I hear a CP. Tio talking about protecting the data and talking to actual customers and how they're using and and really creating value on your products and services. So let's dive into that a little bit. Like let's talk a little bit about what got you out of the lab to get on uh, and travel around the globe a couple of times. I've had a couple of those years, the the seven hundred plus years. And it takes a lot. Um, you don't really know what country you're waking up in. <laughs> so let's talk about what got you out of the lab on the road talking to customers. You're not the marketing guy. You're not the finance guy. You're not the sales guy. So how warm is the water for the CTOs of the world? Why would you jump into that pool? First, you're making me blush. <laughs> um, the, the first part of this is, um, you know, I, I really believe that if you want to know what's going on at a company, you need to understand what your customers are, are actually doing with the products and with the technology, what's working and what isn't. You know, I had a lot of really powerful meetings with, with customers. And, and I don't mean to say powerful customers. I mean, powerful meetings and hearing from customers of all shapes and sizes across all verticals, across all geos, hearing what's working and then what isn't. What's working great, you can pat yourself on the back, but it's the what isn't that gives you the clarity about what you need to be thinking about from a product strategy perspective. You know, when I joined the business, we were really, I would say as a company focused on things like speeds and feeds, we were focused on here is a product of this variety of this class. And here are, you know, X attributes of that product, but we weren't thinking about it from the perspective of what is a customer thinking about when they try to deploy it? What are they trying to solve for? What are they trying to accomplish? And I always go back to that. This Maybe it's the entrepreneurial background of, of Previty, of getting on the road and, and talking so often. And, and for that, I all credit to my, my co-founder. My co-founder at the time saw something in me in terms of, he's like, you're not your standard uh, CTO. You can actually talk about the technology and the product and you're eloquent and, and you can get out on the road. And and you should. And he was the one when we first started the company, you know, to Julian, he's the one that believed in me. And he's the one that asked me to kind of get out there on the road. And that totally changed the trajectory for the company. So I absolutely owe the, those recent years of traveling and, and even building Previty to him and getting me out of my comfort zone, for sure. I think it's such an interesting approach. And, and I think... I'm a bit saddened, actually, that it is such a rare gem to find a CTO who's willing to go out and, and talk and, and not just stay in the comfortable world. We all want to stay in our comfortable zones. And, you know, I was trained as an attorney. So it's really easy to sort of hang up your shoes and, and say, oh, this is the law. And I know this because blah, blah, blah. And you do not. Ha, ha, ha. And I think that's true of most of the sort of business silos in, in a world that was really made for manufacturing. And a lot of our, our metrics, the sigmas and the TQMs and these things are for product focused. And as you were saying, what are our speeds? What are our feeds? What can we measure that is within our factory gates? And, and what you're talking about is actually a lesson I learned from my kids <laughs> is if you can't answer a four-year-old's why, until you get to the point of because I said so, um, you really haven't thought deeply about what they're doing with the product. So what is the why? Like, why do people want to get down and dirty with an application and understand data? I'm putting some thoughts, my thoughts into your brain of like, I always think about data in terms of kinetic motion. If it's not moving, it's not very valuable. Storage is movement. You have to decide to keep ignoring things. <laughs> and like an, and like a child that gets ignored, it just gets noisier and creates more liability. So so what's the why? And, and how do you feel like that year on the road before there was no more road? How do you think that changed you? And then what did you take away into the pandemic to think about, you know, how are you going to pop out in 2021, 2022 into this new 
smarter market for yourself? And, and what are you going to build for your customers? Yeah, no, that, that was so good. Um, and by the way, I really appreciate what you're saying about the why. So as we were talking about before, I have two kids under the age of three. And for me, my eldest daughter, my she calls me up all the time and she's always asking me questions. Oh, well, why, why, why? And it's so easy to, and I can understand how, why pe- people and parents sometimes get frustrated, but there's a level of clarity that you achieve when you can answer that question. And oftentimes I think where parents get frustrated is when they don't genuinely know the answer to something. And I think the frustration is, is actually not being frustrated that the child is asking why. I mean, I think we all love answering questions that our kids bring up. Uh, I think it's more along the lines of, we don't know. And that we don't know makes us feel vulnerable and it's sort of a natural human tendency to kind of put up the barriers, put up the defenses and just kind of say, Oh, stop asking me. No, no one wants that. You know? So I would just sort of say, I think it was uh, Richard Feynman who had effectively like tried to describe mathematics. I think it was mathematics or physics. And I obviously know his background, but um, I'm trying to remember the exact domain now, but he think it was mathematics or physics and he tried to build it up. I think it was math and he tried to build it up on a clean sheet of paper and he did it in two, on two pages. He basically went from the fundamentals of counting to like all the way up to calculus and like being able to go from, from nothing to something. And that's a really important thing. And in the scheme of things for me, when I went out there in the field and I got to hear about how people were deploying things like our web application firewalls or what they were trying to do with database activity monitoring, I learned a lot. And I learned a lot, not just what worked, what needed to be improved upon. I also learned a lot about where they were going and a lot of the times businesses and organizations don't really know what they want. A lot of times they have an idea. Most of the time, just like us, you know, as humans are reactive, businesses are equally as reactive. It's made of humans. So the thing that I find fascinating is oftentimes, you know, your customers may not know what they really need, really want or really need. They know what they want because they see things from marketing and advertising and whatever kind of comes to mind, but what do they actually need? And so getting to set, spend that quality time with them, what was amazing was I amassed all this knowledge in 2019 and in 2020 during the pandemic, took all that knowledge in and effectively rebranded the company. And we went from a business that was all about speeds and feeds and lots of different products and a product portfolio to very crisp, you know, the one sentence of, Adam Perva, we protect data and all paths to it. That's who we are as a business. And what became evident very quickly was when people are deploying application security or even network security or endpoint security, it's actually not about any of those things. People aren't necessarily protecting the network or the applications or the endpoints. They're actually protecting the data. And I know it's somewhat reductive to say it that way, but the networks exist to bring people to applications. Applications which run on endpoints, exist to allow people to access data, whether you want to read information or write information or tamper or delete, whatever. Like you go through applications and APIs to do that. And so that part became super clear in in my brain. And it was one of those things where I worked closely with our CEO and, you know, she and I spent a lot of time thinking about the strategy, the vision and the direction of the company. And we, we put our brains together and, we thought, well, it would make sense to not think about the the company in terms of lots of different products, but let's thematically group them together. And let's try and think about how these groupings can better solve for a real customer pain point. So that's sort of, let's take a step back. Let's see what people are actually doing. And let's reapproach the world with you know, a, a, a story that's stronger, a story that is more aligned to what businesses want. And the feedback was amazing. I mean, I'll tell you right before the pandemic happened, we had our customer advisory board, our, our customer advisory council meeting. It was the last big trip I did. It was uh, to New York right before the pandemic happened. And we all flew there and we unveiled the messaging and the vision and the feedback was so enthusiastic. And through, through last year, we got to unveil that messaging and 
you know, we, we now think about the company, our product strategy, our technology that we're working on and that we're building, our go to market, our marketing, even acquisitions. You know, we've done two large acquisitions since we unveiled that messaging and they fit that sort of construct, that framework around protecting data and all the paths to it. So overall, I believe we're a better company now from not just going out there and listening to our own intuitions, but actually going out there into the world and talking to customers, seeing what people are doing, analyzing the market, the landscape, and not being afraid to say that, you know, we don't know and not being afraid to say, you know what, we actually need to go and acquire companies to help us satisfy this vision. So again, I think we learned a lot in the process and uh, I'm excited about what's what's next for us. Yeah, it, it's such a different approach. And I, I've worked at tons and tons of security focused. I've worked for McAfee Intel. I've worked for Cisco. I worked for Oracle for a little bit. I worked for Sun. I think there's a common theme, I'll say before the pandemic, but probably even before that, where it was, can we do this at all? You know, are the hackers winning? What is the the downside risk? And the push I would have that I'm hearing from you is I've come at this from an intellectual property um, protection and a privacy officer's protection. And so I, it gets back to the why for me is why are you keeping that data? Well, Mm -hmm. I have to keep that data. Well, why do you have to keep that data? Why? And the answer is, well, I need it for analytics. And I was like, great. What are you analyzing? Oh, we don't know yet. But we're going to keep this data for a good long time. And I'm like, so like when you go shopping, do you just like dump whatever you can grab into your car, stick it in your fridge, and then 20 years from now, hope that something magical pops out like wine? Um, because so that's true. not how it works. Like life is not like, like life is not a box of chocolates and they, that would at least have a longer shelf life. So I, I guess, how are you finding your messaging and your point of view landing in, in a sea of we protect things equals enclavism, shutting <laughs> things down, locking out quote unquote bad guys, and I, I won't, I'll, I'll ask you the leading part of that question, but so uh, let's look at the negative side of the ledger right now. How are you, how is this message resonating with people who are used to being afraid and buying things in the hopes of alleviating some fear, or at least looking like they're not the dumbest guy last picked for their, their volleyball game? You know, I, I don't really like organizations that sell to me that kind of take a FUD oriented approach, right? This idea of fear, uncertainty, and doubt is something that is just, it's not palatable. I get messages from vendors all the time. Look, we we need to deploy technologies like every other business. And we have people that sell to us. And one of the sort of interesting things as a vendor, and you've been through this as well, is when you have another organization selling to you in a style that resonates with you, you learn from it. And when you have an organization selling to you in a manner that just doesn't resonate at all, you kind of learn from that too. So the patterns and anti-patterns. And I think over the last year, year and a half of being in lockdown, I've definitely seen a few things. So I would say some anti-patterns and patterns to share a few. I think anti-pattern number one is assuming that people want to meet with you over Zoom. Just because people are doing it doesn't mean they want to. And assuming that People are okay with jumping into a conference or doing remote sessions. I would I would try to not be so forward in that regard. Be respectful of people's times. People are still at home. People have families. You know, I was once on a call and someone was like, "Oh, you didn't have your camera on," and I'm like, "I'm sorry, I have you know a childcare uh, situation right now, and I'm taking care of my youngest." And oh, you it's okay. You can turn your camera on, and I'm like. Eh, you know, not, not happening. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, um, and that's sort of like one extreme of it. There is the, I'm going to sell to fear. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world now around software supply chains. We've seen a rise in an increase of ransomware oriented attacks and everybody tries to jump all over it. Everybody has messaging now that's all ransomware, a product that couldn't stop and definitely has 
any shot of stopping ransomware now apparently solves for supply chain problems, you know? So like that's super, it's super cool. I guess how we can defy the laws of physics with, uh, with some of these products, but you know what? We'll, we'll see where that goes. And I think there's a level of integrity that customers definitely can suss out that, that organizations can suss out. The other thing that I've also seen a really big change around is, and I think a lot of people still don't understand it is in the past, CIOs and CISOs, they were the ones that would typically make a decision around, let's say, security products and security spend. This was my next question. You're anticipating it. Has your customer ah. changed because of your approach? It, it has changed because the CIO and CISO are now covering way more areas of risk than they used to. And the newer practice areas have emerged in their organization. And we've seen a rise of things like DevOps. And so how does security fit into that world? And now we see, you know, DevOps with security mixed around it. Uh, we've also seen the rise of SecOps as well. And when we're looking at going to talk to organizations now, we don't, again, think about this concept of feeds and, spe and speeds. It's more around, okay, this is someone in a DevOps role. This is someone in a SecOps role. What do they care about? Because ultimately, if you can solve for problems that they have and that they're thinking about, then that will unlock a couple of critical things, including the decision by the CIO and CISO, because more often than not now, what's going on is the CIO and CISO are deferring to folks on the team that are going to be hands-on with the product and the solution, and they're letting them make the decision. Whereas in the past, it used to be very top-down now we're seeing a change where it's become bottoms up. And I, and I really like that. If in a, in a way, it, it is really democratized the way that technology is procured now within an organization. And I think we're going to see better outcomes for many of these businesses that are selecting technologies where it's no longer going to be something that is pushed from the top down. Thou must, must use this. And instead, it's going to flip around where, hey, CISO, we looked at the market and we thought that this was a really good technology. We played with it for two to three weeks. We tested it out and we think this is going to solve a lot of our problems. I, th We think we should go and make this investment. And that's a much more compelling story versus a top-down approach. And, you know, I think going back to the whole pattern, anti-pattern thing, I think if you can focus on clear pain points that people have, uh, not blurring the lines of what your products can and can't do, having high integrity. I have exited product discussions and, and potential deals with prospects simply because we were not the right fit for the business. You know, I I have looked at it and said, listen, you're really solving for another type of issue. While we could theoretically do that with our product, I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction and lead you the wrong way. And that's actually worked really well for us where they said, we really appreciate that. And you know what, for that integrity, if something comes up in the future around what it is that you do, then we'll reach back out. And I would say nine out of 10 times, we get a phone call back in, in you know the next six to eight months, which is, hey, we're back. And everything that you talked about, we want to have that discussion with you, which is which is great. And it's a, it's a high integrity decision, discussion that we have, more conversational, less high pressure -y, uh sales, if that makes sense. And, you know, I think that's sort of the new way of doing it now. And, and so when we go to the market with this, the story, protecting data and all the paths to it, we always explain what the paths are to data. So the app, the networking stack, uh, APIs that exist, and people really resonate with that. And they're like, oh, cool. So those are all the different things. And that dovetails nicely into what we do as a business. And then we don't force people to say, you must have all of these capabilities, no, it's a pretty big ecosystem. Businesses have more than 75 different vendors and technologies that they work with. So our goal isn't to replace all 75. Our goal is to find a way to solve a problem. And I think people really like that. And I think people like the fact that eventually they could look at us as a consolidated play or a trusted partner. And I think that's the new way we want to do business. And I think that's the new way a lot of businesses coming up now are thinking about go to market which is a good thing there's there's two sides of this and i'm i'm selfishly thinking of you know i'm building a software company myself and talking to venture capitalists i think the thought of the bottoms up sale go to market plan 
would probably make half of Sand Hill Road's brain matter be, you know, splattered on the mall. It, so that's one side of my brain. The other side of my brain wants to say, how do you get working teams, operational teams who have maybe piloted something, played with something, said this solves a problem? How do you knit together those sort of micro strategies into one coherent story for those customers? Are they are they going to get tugged around in 25 different directions by someone who likes a widget or or likes a UI? How do you sort of go through those things of you want a consistent, planful, thoughtful go-to-market, and you also want a consistent strategy so that you're not overspending or spending on 10 of the same types of, you know, black shoe? Oh, valid, valid questions. And I had a, I remember when we were going through that process and I remember it felt like it was just yesterday, but, but it was, it was a while ago, the rules have absolutely changed. And I think when you think about the leverage that many of the venture capital firms have, it's really around getting you connected to people that they know in their network. And, you know, when you get to a top tier VC firm, I won't name names, they can typically get you an, a conversation with a prospect because they have those contacts. Maybe they're those banks, if they are working with financial services customers, as an example, maybe they're LPs in their funds. And so they have an opportunity to basically get you to those banks and to those financial services companies without you having to hire sales reps and, and folks to go and find your way into those accounts. That's great. But it's also just not the way that things get done. Uh, I can tell you anecdotally, as someone who went through that process, it would be great to get those meetings. But just because a venture firm or a partner you know, made that introduction means that there's zero obligation for two things to happen. One, the other side to actually follow through and schedule that meeting. And two, for anything to come about. I actually don't think we closed any deal looking back at our history based on leverage from any of the, the folks that invested money into us. I actually think, in fact, all of our large deals at Previty were from us hustling, from us doing our work. And I think for people that are kind of hoping that you're going to get maximum leverage from these venture firms because they can make these large introductions, great, they'll make introductions, but your product still has to work. And, and you got to have the goods, your strategy needs to be there. And one of the things that really resonates with me is having a strategy from the get-go versus kind of winging it and figuring it out. You know, the part that's changed now is I would say every product needs a free variant. You need it because people want to try your products. People want to go in and see what they are. You need a way to jump in and, and give people, a, whether it's through a free tier or whether it's, you know, a few weeks free, you need a way for people to get exposed to that sort of product because they've never seen it before. They don't know what it is. And that's a low cost way to now do sales development and business development. Whereas in the past, it was just really a ton of work to bring on a large team. And so I think the companies that are getting it right now are the ones that don't have incredibly robust sales forces, the sort of next gen new breed of businesses out there. And they're playing it up where they've built all the automation They've got billing, maybe consumption-based billing in their platform. They've got everything all set up so that way someone can come in and without having to be in a high-pressure sales situation, they can just choose to put a credit card in. And, and now uh, you have an annuity coming in from your perspective and they're getting a product from their end. But going back to the second part of your question, product strategy is absolutely paramount. And I think it's really important for every business to have a product strategy before you even think about a go-to-market. And that, that product strategy can change and it should change over time because as you go from different sizes as a business, from small to medium to large, you end up changing the composition of the team. So in the beginning, you're a bunch of hackers. To the mid-stage, mid you're becoming a lot more professional. To uh, when you're large, you have way more structure in the organization. Maybe you filled out more middle management uh, to try and accomplish some of these things. And you need the product strategy to adjust with it. You may be scrappy in the beginning, but that's the execution side, but the strategy still remains the same. And what you end up finding is that you just end up executing 
on your strategy, maybe in more professional ways as your business scales up. But you should be free to change your mind. You should be free to change your idea based on new competition that comes in. Um, let's say a cloud services provider now gets into your world. I mean, that's something that we think of all the time as security vendors. What's going to happen when enter your cloud security provider decides that they want to do security now, right? We think about that stuff. And so we need a, a strategy that can be reactive and at the same time, one that allows us to invest in and allow us to really differentiate ourselves from whoever may come into that world. So I, I know there was a lot there, but I really love that question. Yeah, no, and I, I really love the answer. So <laughs> it's good. It's it's what I'm thinking through is like, again, as you said, it, and it so resonates, it's like you start in as a hacker to say like, this is something I know, I'm watching the bleed, and I have a Band-Aid. How are we going to get this Band-Aid attached to that leg? Do you, in your, in your strategy musing, and, and I'm sort of, I'm thinking in, in terms of, of a smarter market, and, and there's more and more distribution of buying and leverage and trying and sampling, but it's a big, complex, highly regulated world these days. Are you thinking about what are the conditions in which you would exit part of your strategy or is there like a, here's plan A, plan B, plan C, or are you more like, hey, let's burn the boats and this is what the future looks like. And I talked to customers, so they agree with me. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing you should know about me is I, I have no problem being totally transparent. So I'll, I'll tell you um, how we think about the world. There's the application security part of our portfolio and the data security part of the portfolio. Data, I'll start with data. I'll work bottoms up and bottoms up in terms of, you know, what people are really after. So let's start with data sort of as the, the layer that, that really underpins everything. I think on the data side, for the longest time, businesses were so focused on things like data discovery, data classification, and that's really important, right? Now we call it table stakes, but for the longest time, businesses just didn't know where their data was. And I think people are going to go through that again. Uh, now that more and more people are going to the cloud um, and people I saw in COVID as an example, financial services that had three, four year roadmaps to move to cloud services providers, they like did it inside of four to five months and they like just picked up databases and they just moved them. And, you know, it's funny because without, again, dropping names, you'd follow up with some of these companies and you'd ask them. So how did you do that move? I mean, it must have been in intense to scan all that data and verify what was there. And they were like, we didn't even have that time. We had to just pick up and move from one place to another. And I think what we're going to find is over time, there will be side effects from people that were rushing through the digital transformation. And we're going to see it on the data side. At least that's my, my first prediction is as we were going through this last year, whether it's people who haven't correctly uh, permissioned uh, access to the data or they haven't permissioned uh, various roles correctly or they've got just sort of open uh, data repositories or information that simply should never have moved because maybe because of uh, regulatory requirements that should never have left the station. Uh, and so there's that part to the data side. But where I see a lot of potential in data security now is really around privacy and you know, it's funny, we we made an acquisition last year. We bought a company called JSONAR. And we saw what was going on in the realm of data. You know, and Perva is a, an almost two-decade-old company. And it started off doing AppSec and DataSec together. And on the data security side, the business was formed around building things like database agents that would plug in to data stores, which would be in large on-prem physical environments. And the business has done very, very well on that. But now we're looking at a world where people are going to move to the cloud. Newer types of data will be created in the cloud. People will migrate data stores to the cloud. And an agent architecture isn't the right thing. Not just because agents don't work in the cloud. They can. But in certain cases, you actually can't even install something like an agent because the cloud services providers just don't let you have that level of access. And so you need to find a different approach. I met with uh, Ron, who is the, the founder of JSONAR, several years ago, and he is just an amazing soul, one of the smartest 
product thinkers you'll ever come across. Uh, he was the progenitor of of agents um, and data agents. So he built uh, Guardium, sold that to IBM, then started JSONAR, and we acquired uh, Ron's company. And when you talk to Ron, he's like, look, we just did this wrong, right? Where we were going through the path of installing agents, and we understood that there was a lot of things around compliance. But when you think about what people are really after now, it's not just people looking to address compliance use cases. It's really about people that are trying to solve for very acute, painful things. I mean, we've been talking collectively as an industry about privacy for years now. I, I, I saw this all the way back when I was doing Previty. Well, privacy would always come up and every year always feels like the year of privacy. Well, here's the thing. It's always going to be the year of privacy. I keep waiting. Make it be the year of privacy. I'm ready. But I think it's happening. If you look at the total addressable market of privacy, it's one of the fastest growing areas right now in all of cyber. And it's one of the fastest growing areas in, in data security. And it makes sense because you have a lot of, a lot of requirements now maybe at a country level or at a national level, or could even be down at a, uh, at a city level. I'm thinking about New York City as an example. And there's a lot of requirements that businesses are going to have to figure out how they adhere to. And not all of them, especially the larger ones, know what to do correctly. I mean, you brought up something earlier about people who keep data around just to keep data around. I remember when things like Hadoop were first coming out and the, the sort of messaging from a bunch of the, the different Hadoop vendors was, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't delete your data. Just throw it into a data lake, right? And so what's emerged is now we've got all these data ponds, right? We have all these data ponds and people don't know what's in them. They're not data ponds. They're data sewage. Don't drink that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Oh. Get your mouth away from that. Oh, data sewage. That's so good. That's so good. I'm going to have to use that now. That's so, so good. But you're absolutely right. There is quite a bit of data sewage and in data security and even in privacy, garbage in, garbage out, right? So one of the things that I really believe is going to be an important driver for everyone is going to be privacy. And we made a really big bet. We acquired JSONAR at the end of last year, not just to power the future of our data security business, but Ron and the team were already underway with initiatives around privacy and the way that they were doing it just absolutely resonated with, with us. And so we made that strategic acquisition last year. So that's what we see going on, on on the data security side. And then the recalibration that we see when you go up the stack to applications and APIs is monoliths have been breaking down. And when I say monoliths, these large application code bases that used to be millions of lines of code have now broken down into lots of individual applications. Uh, APIs now rule the day, uh, microservices as well. A significant percentage of our CloudWAF traffic that we're protecting day in and day out is actually all APIs today, uh, which is amazing to see, right? So a really robust change in the landscape. And that enabled us or really prompted us to do an acquisition at the beginning of the year. We acquired a company, uh, Cloud Vector. Uh, they focused on protecting APIs. But, you know, again, a team that that has worked so closely together for several companies now. I met with uh, the founders, uh, Levin and, and Ravi, and amazing folks that really, really thought about the world differently. And when they were talking about API security, and I shared with them the, the vision that was in my brain around the Imperva strategy and where we're going, they then shared a, a, another presentation with me of how they thought about APIs with respect to data. And for them, it was always about data. It was always about understanding the data going over these APIs. We just saw eye to eye and it was just this sort of perfect thing where we got into this discussion with each other philosophically. The technology, of course, checked out and now they're on board and we're building out the future of API security. So when I think about the framework of how we, where we see the company going for us, we really do want to take the story around data and treat it more as a lens and all of our products need to look through that lens. So in the, the core data security business, it's, it's a no brainer, but when you go up the stack for things like applications and APIs, what are we doing around data? How can we better tell a data oriented story? Not just because um, we can do it, but it's because these are the questions that people are going to have after they've solved for 
you know, I now have visibility as to uh, what's going on in my ponds, my lakes, and my sewage. But when I go all the way up now to my application layer, I have no clue from a data perspective what's going on there. And, and that's ultimately what I would love to be able to do is remove those blind spots. You know, if we're successful, we will acquire more businesses. We will make a name for ourselves and allowing people to better protect that data wherever it's going through. It could be in prem, could be in the cloud, could be through service meshes or containers. And it doesn't matter if it's structured or unstructured or semi-structured data. We want to do that. And we, we want to find a sensible and a reasonable way to do all of those things, of course, while meeting what our customers are after, which is things like uptime and high quality security and performance. And we got to tie all of that, that stuff together. So that, that's what's top of mind for me. I, I figured I would be totally transparent and just share all of that with you in terms of how we think about the stack and how it all kind of comes together. Well, it's exciting for me. I mean, I've been a data gal my whole career, first in intellectual property and then into privacy. And and your speaking must speak because the way I look at it is if you think about a human organism, my body composition, my what I've eaten today, the bacteria that are processing it, whether they belong to my genetic code or not, they you know, think about them as my supply chain, the blood, the the various systems, all of that stuff is so complex. It has to work in synergy. And then the API is my mouth. So your mouth is telling people what, you know, sometimes in English and sometimes, you know, you stick your tongue out and say, ah, and is, you know, <laughs> are your tonsils swollen or your teeth gray or something. Data is the composition of the why and the APIs are the language that it speaks. And I, I always quote Grace Hopper from 1965, I mean, 65 last century, mm. when she said one day information will be on the corporate balance sheet, for in most cases, it is more valuable than the hardware that processes it. And I've always mm. said it because I, I've always said information is the why. And the people, if you've got customers or you have employees or you exist in a community, you have privacy concerns because we're the ones who consume, we're the ones who share, we're the ones who are observed. And I think you know, when I when I decompile the great compilers uh, statement, I liked it initially because I said, look, we belong in the C-suite. You know, we call ourselves chief privacy officers, but we really belong at the board level. But now that I'm I'm thinking about the way you're talking about it and the way that I've I, I truly as a true believer believe um, information belongs on the balance sheet, because once you have not just quote unquote, protected. I think protected is both assets and liabilities, right? So you've protected and you've given it the best shot. It's kind of, again, we'll go back to parenting. I've protected my kids by allowing them to go off into the world and be educated. Well, that's risky, but I'm protecting them because the future will want a better educated, socialized individual. So by protecting and locking down, that's sort of part of it, understanding what the APIs have to say about the content, you get to this notion where you began, which is data and information that's derived from that data. Why is it on the corporate balance sheet? Because it's investable. It's mm -hmm. the person who's looking at a smarter company doesn't just say how many marbles, how many assets, how many employees. It's how many ideas, how quickly can you put them to use? how many thought leaders are allowed to lead, how much is the strategy something that answers that ephemeral why, 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 why. So um, that's my particular personal soapbox. And so I, I think it's really, it's an exciting time. And I, I think it's actually a little bit of an unusual conversation when you're talking about the typical asset protection, lockdown, mm -hmm. keep it safe, stay compliant. I, you know, compliance for me is kind of a dirty word. It's like, eh, you know, I'm a lawyer. I, I get law. It's about the mistakes that we've made as a community in the past. Strategy mm -hmm. is what you do about that in the future. You, of course, you avoid that same mistake. That's what learning is. But also, what would it be like if we could communicate more freely in the ways that we wanted? What if we could have um, different personas so we can be one way with our kids and another way with our professional colleagues? Those what if answers, I think, are that's that's exciting frontier. And it sounds like um, you've got a lot of freedom to to roam um, 
as a CTO, which is amazing. So I think it's that's fun. great. And it shows it shows that your CEO also has a lot of dignity to her, that she's giving the people who want to think about these hard problems uh, room to do it. Yeah, I'm I'm so grateful I get to work with an incredible team and a team that is incredibly thoughtful, not just about the short term, but also very open to understanding what the world is going to look like and unafraid to make bold bets where we need to. And again, the partnership that I have with with our team has just been tremendous. So I really appreciate them and I value the discussions that we've been able to have. You know, when I when I think about what comes next. And, you know, maybe to not turn the tables on, on, on you, but to kind of, cause this is, um, this is really interesting when you think about privacy and when you think about where we are right now and what's left to do, where do you see the gaps right now? You know, there's a lot of businesses that are just so focused on things like the automation of requests that come in, right? There's a lot of businesses that are really looking at privacy through that lens but it feels like we can and we should be doing a lot more than that. And so I'm really curious to get your thoughts on where you see from what you've done in your past to maybe what you're thinking about in the business that you want to build, where do you see gaps or where do you see vectors that you think maybe are contrarian, maybe they're different, but we, if we could do these things, we could not only you know check the box, so to speak, but we ultimately give organizations or we allow organizations to put themselves in a very better position, you know? So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I, I have a, a probably contrarian, but getting, becoming less contrarian, which makes me excited. I think there's a couple of things in the trends in, in particularly in the privacy tech space. And there actually is a privacy tech space, which is like super exciting to me. The, the first winners, unicorns, the Sand Hill Road darlings, are compliance where and and they're they're there and they're making as much money as they are because it's expensive to hire humans with clipboards to make reports and so if you can automate that process you're taking a lot of pain and and adding a bit more consistency so no casting of shade but the first ones out the box were about compliance because it was an expensive problem to get wrong where I'm excited and where we're building is it, it I say shift left, but it is it's like all the way back to the farm. It's not even going to the market to get your mise en place. It, oh, you you gotta tell okay, so shifting left of data. This is interesting. So when when people hear the phrase shifting left right now, they they really think about it in terms of getting back all the way to when people are architecting and developing an application. You know, how do you test it? How do you understand it for interesting things? When you're thinking about shifting left with respect to data and even around and through the lens of privacy, what does that mean? Because that just that just blows my mind right now. Um, so, you, you, yeah, you, you have to explain yourself and, and what you're thinking of, because that's a fundamentally different way to think about it, because no one ever thinks about the data life cycle and maybe to kind of like draw this out. Right. What are you thinking about there? Because that, that sounds cool. I start with old ideas because I, I think that humanity tends to refine things over time. Um, totally agree. So when we first, we published a book called The, the uh, Privacy Engineer's Manifesto. I'm sure you've read it to your kids. They love it. I wrote it with my father, who was a mainframe security guy starting from, you know, the 50s in the Navy and, and working, you know, he claims to be retired now, if not true. And also is an attorney and also has an MBA. My mother was an intellectual property lawyer. So I swore I would never get into tech and I would never get into law. And of course, she ended up doing both because that's how life is. There's God up there and, and she's funny. And so I would call home and say, what do we do when I have X amount of budget? I have conflicting regulations that don't seem to care about their main mission to protect humans. And so basically, we got we got really reductive about what is privacy? So the first sort of flame that I flew into the pot is to say that privacy functionally, for me, breaks down to the authorized processing, personally identifiable or and or personal data, according to moral, ethical, legal, and sustainable principles. 
And so as you break that down into a shift left paradigm that says, what are the requirements to authorization? How do I know something's authorized? And is it more than just, did I put a form in a checkbox? Or is it really the whole context and even what you're saying about having a free element of experiencing something sets an expectation? And then do you have the, the right to authorize? So all of these things, as you go through the life cycle of how do you observe, collect, end of life, and think about the value of human data, and then instead of looking at it as a linear function, this is a this is a derivative. This is geometry now. You're getting into like differential equations because <laughs> my relationship with you, because obviously we see things eye to eye. We're going to do business together. I don't know how, but by gosh, we're going to do business. And so our relationship commercially is about to go from we just met to wow, right? And then over time, eventually I'm going to retire and you're going to be like, oh, you'll kind of wave at me in my rocking chair because I'm a lot older than you. And so the commercially, the relationship may go down, but I may then go up with you as some sort of wizened, wizened grandma figure for your kids. So there's all these kind of complex things. And, and think about your customers. You know, when your customer is first enchanted and tries one thing, um, this is the interesting thing I think about all these data stores and this, you know, this, the advertising markets that think that they're smarter than our own touch and feel humanity is. Over time, if someone continually trusts in your brand and tries new things and you know they're always the first person to experience the new stuff or you know the guy that's going to do it as soon as 10 other people are doing it these are decisions these are strategic knowledge points that aren't static that just say mike smith mm -hmm. so if you think about data as a dynamic and almost organic type of thing how you follow through with the fair information principles you're adding in elements like safety. So I'll give you, for instance, my, my daughter who's going to be mad at me because she was trying to FaceTime me while we were recording. She has a playlist on one of these popular music sharing apps. And the apps allow anyone to send and share their playlist. Well, she, she's, you know, I'm biased, but she's a pretty attractive young lady. And so she gets all these people sending her these playlists. What this platform doesn't allow for is blocking like you do in other social platforms. Ah. So they hadn't thought about the hacker inside the, the mind of the teenage boy um, with an object of his affection who has no interest in him. And so what they've done is the, the young men will flood the feed with like really horrifying, you know, graphic misogynistic oh, garbage, <laughs> right? So now oh. you're starting to think about, you know, safety in, in addition to, I want to be on this app. I want to share my music. I want to be cool. And I want to do all the things that, that the designers intended for the platform. But at the same time, here you've got these human hackers doing something that was completely intended, sharing, following, uh, but they're training the algorithms. So it's when you think about examples such as those, I find it goes so much further than the code. It's like, of course, you're functionally working here. But the question is, you know, do you want all of that teenage angst music following you into your 20s? Or do you want to have a key pair attached to your identity persona for teenage angst music that drops away in three to five years? It, these are the decisions and, and the design choices that you make if you've shifted all the way to the left. And, and that's on the creative side. On the On the more you know, formalized, how do we sell this platform? A lot of developers really do want to do the quote unquote right thing to be a data fiduciary. They, they don't want to put zero days in. They don't want to make data exploited or share it where it shouldn't be. But they really don't know how to break it down into these fair information principles of proportionality and minimization and security mm -hmm. and, and cross-border requirements. And even you know, supply chain within an organization. So once you've said yes over here, it doesn't mean necessarily that once your supply chain comes and joins a data element to it. So that's, that's part of what we're talking about is breaking down those design principles into solvable categories um, that are found in every single law, at, you know, since the beginning of privacy, you know, since, I mean, the Hammurabi's code is one of the oldest privacy laws. The technology said a, a man could peep in and see another man's wife in a state of undress. And apparently that was going down because they wrote it down about what would happen to this person if they did that. Not nice things, you know, TLDR. Um, 
But that was the technology. And, and the thing that they were protecting was, you know, women basically were chattel and, and hopefully there was some affection there. So protecting the economic interest to have a woman with a clean reputation, protecting the, the home of we're, we're hoping and supposing some affection and protecting the culture as a nice and good and safe culture to live in. So they created the code and it's an interesting choice, right? It's a code to repeatedly routinized behaviors and consequences. So now we're talking about the privacy code drops in. And so routinely, what is the technology? What is its limitation? What do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. What are the, you know, so just like we have crumple zones for our cars. I read a, a brilliant paper once called the moral crumple zone. What is the data you're willing to lose? So that all of the pressure goes there. And it's not necessarily a honeypot. It may be just this is the stuff that's less embarrassing or harmful or lasting from a persona. So um, it's a long-winded answer to your question. No, it's great. It's great. And and there's two or three parts um, that I was just jotting down to follow up on uh, with this. The first is there's an opportunity to apply principles like software composition analysis to privacy. I think there's an opportunity to maybe you know take the phrase privacy composition analysis and kind of build that up and out. If you think about, there've been a couple of watershed moments that have helped shape this industry. One of them was when Microsoft released uh, <laughs> Windows XP and it wasn't good. And we had the whole Bill Gates uh, memo that went out to, uh, to Microsoft, which was, we need to get serious about security. And that emerged the, the secure software development lifecycle and you know, I would say modern security development practices today uh, can be pointed to that watershed moment, many of them. Some businesses have been pretty good about it. And that kicked off eventually things like software composition analysis um, as the sort of area. But if you think about it, privacy has been around for, for some time. What we don't do a really good job at is thinking about privacy as we are building the system. And not even as we are like coding the system, but I would say all the way back to even threat modeling to sort of the example that you gave before around abuse of what's going on inside of a music app for sharing playlists. Yeah, because someone didn't think about it. Someone genuinely didn't think about how this could be abused. And, you know, there is this element of not just privacy, but there's going to need to be almost a framework or something that needs to be developed and it will start likely being, you know, a manual process and hopefully can be automated through different probes and sensors throughout the life cycle and maybe even through software instrumenting things. But hopefully we can get ahead, our, ahead of ourselves and catch things like that. As I think about it now, as that, as that particular example, what's stopping me from being really crude or sending really crude messages or receiving crude messages from someone who's using Venmo as an example. And as long as they're paying me like a single cent, they can send me anything and everything they want, including, you know, like pictures or emojis or whatever. And for them, the cost is a cent. Venmo makes money. They're, they don't want to turn that behavior off. And, you know, it's, you're getting me to think very differently now about this, uh, this landscape. So thank you for that. And the other thing that I'll share is, there is an element that sort of underpinned my entire career, which is having the ability to take a more long-term view. I think Silicon Valley and, you know, I, I won't say all of Silicon Valley, but there is definitely a class of investors that are just out there to make returns because that's what they need to do for their LPs. If you're lucky, you get to work with the ones that care about doing something truly transformative mm -hmm. and the ones that are willing to take a more long-term view. And I always go back to the, the Ben Graham quote, which is in, in the short run, the market's like a voting machine, but in the long run, the market is like a weighing machine. And it's so true. And what you find is with technology and with great ideas in Silicon Valley, it may not be the, the du jour uh, that other businesses are pushing out. And that's okay. Like to the point that you brought up, yes, there's a lot of companies that are focused on the automation and that's okay, but we need to take it a step further. And if you can see what that step further is, you should be able to build that thing now. And knowing that 
you've built um, that 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 is built around a methodology or a framework that you've crafted in your mind and you've validated it and you've tested it then by all means it's really just a matter of time before you know that market will emerge and you can do things to help catalyze and, and build that market out by yourself naturally that will that will come to pass so it's just really interesting timing is so important but if you can afford to take a more long-term view and, and the sort of last thing is an entrepreneur I admire significantly is um, Patrick Carlson of Stripe. He's one of the founders of Stripe and he is all about long-term thinking. And, you know, when he talks about Stripe as an example, it's like, it's just early innings, right? I mean, we're just getting started with spending and, and deploying capital online, whether you're using money to buy things or you're transferring money or you're collecting payments. And as as humanity, we've been doing this for a long, long time, right? We've been bartering, we've been trading, but the internet's only been around for at least the modern internet with, he's been around for what, 20, 30 years. And we're just sort of scratching the surface of what can and can't be done. And, and he's absolutely right. It's early innings. And I think to you, as, as you embark on, on your journey, it's early innings and, and you can absolutely take a more long-term view if you believe that you're correct. And, what I would like to see more of, and I used to see a lot more of this a long, long time ago is people that are willing to dig in and say, you know what? I do believe in what I'm building. I have conviction and I believe this is something that is going to be a problem. And I know it because whether I've lived through it, I've been through this or I'm hearing about it, I'm convinced I need to do this. Then you do it, you know? And whereas I do see a lot of people that are kind of looking to chase a buck or chasing an exit and they end up compromising all the way down. And, you know, you don't really build what you want to build. Your exit isn't that meaningful at the end, if at all. And so my, my only feedback and suggestion for any entrepreneur is, and really anyone who's out of business, including where I'm at right now, I'm trying to take a more long-term view. Um, the short term will work itself out naturally because you need to survive and you need to do the basic things to get there. But if you can afford to take a long-term view, you can set yourself up in, in a way that I think others can't because they're not taking that that sort of view. They're not doing that work. And it is work, right, to, to do that. It is work. And it, it's, it never looks like the cotton candy company. Um, it's it's a company that's it's it's solid. It's that comfortable go-to pair of jeans. It may not be the latest style, but we know it works and we know that it's it's going to the right place and it's a classic. It's you know, respect for human beings is never going out of style. There's someone I follow on Twitter. His name is Sahil Bloom and he has an excellent account. I'd really recommend checking it out. He he posted I think it was in the last week. It was foxes versus hedgehogs. When you think of a fox, a fox can do so many things, is incredibly agile, right? Can do, uh, it can outmaneuver many, many different creatures in, in, in the woods, I guess, to continue this going, <laughs> continue the story about a fox uh, versus a hedgehog just as one thing, right? And it's this idea of being someone that's very generalized, someone that can do lots of different things versus someone that's hyper specialized. And I won't spoil it for you um, or for those that are going to listen to this, but definitely check that out. It's a it's a wonderful Twitter thread and really kind of goes deep into uh, the virtues of either being a fox or, or being a hedgehog and what you end up seeing over time when those two kind of get compared in different types of asset classes. So it's, it's really interesting to see. I love it. And, and, I, and I love that this comes full circle because you know, my co-author and, and 20 year long business partner, his name happens to be Jonathan Fox. Um, and my current business partner is a fox. Uh, she is a unicorn. She's a privacy person. She's a database security patent holder. And I am clearly a hedgehog. I've been obsessed with data. Um, since I'll, and I'll end with a story that I, I tell frequently in the privacy world of how I got into technology at all is I bumbled into, there was a, a pink, uh, flyer at the Ohio state university when I was uh, 18 and it said they wanted a research assistant for a robotics lab. And I thought, Ooh, I like robots. I like computers. Um, you know, my dad, I was raised on a raised floor. You know, I, I spent my That's childhood awesome. running around, <laughs> you know? Um, so, um, I, although I did get in trouble for, um, 
shuffling punch cards and using them for Monopoly one money once at Standard Oil Company. So sorry, guys, uh, wherever you are. But the most meaningful moment was, so I go in there and we start training these handicapped children, uh, paraplegic and quadriplegic kids, all with significant disabilities um, to use science. And so we use this robotic arm and it was to pour the beakers and count things and, and do things, you know, that an industrial 1980s style Rico arm could do on an Apple IIe plus. Um, so, I mean, this is like old school, right? Literally old school. And, and the technology to your, to, you know, how we started this discussion, the technology was really important. The technology just with one robot and a, and a handful of very large computers and every bit of the software, 100% custom. It was very expensive. It took the majority of the grant uh, budget to see if it could, quote unquote, work. And so along comes a young Michelle. Um, and my job was to take notes, facilitate uh, the lesson and sort of keep track of the keystrokes of the child. And the keystrokes was a, a modified paddle that basically said, identify the joint plus minus for open, close, and then go. So it was quite laborious to do stuff. So a long story, just a tad bit longer. At the end of the day, all the kids learned how to hack it. So they learned the combinations that would make it reset and drop a beaker or pour water or do all these things that the people who owned the hardware were freaking the flip out. And there in the room was like two people eyeball to eyeball. And these children who could not negotiate for toys or play with things or, or move around or even pick out their own food or clothing, they laughed, every one of them. They looked me in the eye and I realized, wow, that's what technology is for. It's not about the robot. It's about the laugh. Yeah. It, was, it was never about the robot it, and it never will be. Um, the way I think we will all kind of look back on this is, again, take a long-term view. We've been able to have a front seat for both of us. We've been able to build. And if you think about the world as at least what we're doing right now as a series of abstractions that people in the future will be able to build upon. I'm really, really excited for what humanity can do. I'm an optimist like you. I, I tend to not, I, I tend to not take a negative view on any of these things. We have incredible technology. We've, we've got the skills to do some amazing things. And if we can make sure that we're building things that can be leveraged, by the right people and assuming incentives. Cause again, sadly, that's the way the world works. We have the opportunity to be a civilization like Krypton, not to be a nerd, a Superman nerd, but like we could be Krypton, right? We could, we could definitely build something that's truly amazing. And that's the hope, right? The hope is that the work that we're doing now over time will be laughed at and ridiculed um, because it was so simplistic and so incredibly pedantic. You know, it's amazing to see how far we've come. I remember all the way back, you know, big clunky old hard drives to when they got smaller and then we got to solid state drives. And now we're talking about biological hard drives as an example, right? So it's amazing to see the, pro the progression. And I'm excited like you and, and with you and alongside with you to build the future of all of this and also excited what this unlocks for humanity going forward. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Smarter Markets and our continuing examination of digital identity and its role in building a trust-based economy. Please help us get the word out about the podcast by leaving your ratings and reviews on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Your support and engagement means the world to us, as does your help spreading the word about Smarter Markets via social media and word of mouth. On behalf of ABEX, I'm Michelle Dennity. See you again next week. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets. For free episode transcripts, visit smartermarketspod.com. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. 
always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Smarter Markets, its producers, sponsors and hosts, Eric Townsend and Abex Technologies, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets.